engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's nine after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is WSB. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. And I'm going to pivot from all the news topics of the day to something that actually becomes topical. And you're just going to have to let me vent here for a minute. And I know many of you share the same concerns. My kids in their school use everyday mathematics, uh, a program at the University of Chicago. Y'all, can I tell you how irritating it is that my kids cannot figure out their mathematical homework and yet are taught by their teachers to derisively refer to the way their mother and I learned how to do math as the granny method? And it is baked into Common Core, which we don't talk about enough. You know, Georgia claims it got rid of Common Core when it didn't. All it did was change the name of Common Core. And the mathematics program that my kids use and that your kids use at your Common Core school are increasingly mathematics divergent from 5,000 years of human history and how we've always done math. Suddenly, you're no longer allowed to do cross-multiplication. In fact, my wife was talking to a teacher the other day who were ranting about this and said, well, the kids don't do cross-multiplication anymore. What do you mean the kids? Kids still do cross multiplication. Cross multiplication was discovered by the Jews in the 15th century BC. We've been doing it since the 15th century BC. Cross multiplication. The French were doing it. The French Revolution. They went back to it. They called it the three rule system, and it's just cross multiplication. And suddenly, it's the granny method, and the kids aren't allowed to do it anymore. It drives me crazy. Meanwhile, listen to this. There is a story today by Reed Wilson in the Hill. Headline: U.S. economy faces impending skills gap. Economists, demographers, and political leaders are increasingly concerned that the next generation of workers won't be ready to fill millions of new jobs across the country. The combination of a generational sea change in the workforce and a technological revolution in the economy is conspiring to create a skills gap that could leave jobs unfilled, experts say. And you know one of the problems with those skills? Math skills. And you can't help your kids do math anymore because the way you learn how to do math is called the granny method. And you're not allowed to do the granny method. Our kid had a, had a homework assignment last night. It was obvious. Do cross multiplication. But they weren't allowed to do cross multiplication. And you think, well, you know, just say that the unknown un, unknown variable is an X and you're solving for it. Well, nope, can't do that either. You're not allowed to solve for X anymore. I guess it's racist. I have no idea. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is common core math. The way that they're training kids now to do math is, okay, so how would you do this? Let's say you have seven numbers. You have seven numbers, and you want to find the average of those seven numbers. How do you do it? Well, the way I learned how to do it is you add the seven numbers, and then you divide by seven. And there's your average. Nope, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Not not in this class, not in this math. Nope, nope. You have to draw a line and you have to plot all the numbers. And you have to look for the dots and figure out from the dots what the average is. You can't just add them up and divide by, by the overall number. Nope, can't do that. Cannot do math the way Pythagoras was doing math. I, I, wait, I wonder if you can even learn the Pythagorean theorem these days in mathematics. You know, I was good in math. I made A's in math. Went to law school because I didn't want to keep doing math the rest of my life, but I could do it. And there was a way that I did it, and it was the way my dad learned, and his dad learned, and his dad learned. All 16 Eric's going back thousands of years in Sweden. I mean, we were raping and pillaging Vikings across northern Europe doing math in our head back then, but you can't do it now because it's the granny method. Y'all, this is ridiculous. And we keep having these stories come out like this one today that the United States is running into a skilled labor problem in part because of kids learning mathematics. But Common Core is here to tell us that all of our kids are going to be little autonomous worker bees who do things the way major corporations want them to do so they can't think for themselves and ever dare compete against major corporations. Because when they do, they call it the granny method. And it's invalid, not because it doesn't work, but because it's outmoded, outdated, and still works a whole lot better than what they're introducing to our kids right now. But they don't want our kids to be able to think outside the box or think for themselves. They want to be dictated to by corporations through Common Core. It is a load of crap. It is. There. I've had my piece. 
we can be done venting finally about last night's math homework. Charlie says, I probably shouldn't have made the crack about the Vikings raping and pillaging across Northern Europe. Listen, they're my ancestors. I am not ashamed of my ancestry. We discovered North America long before that poser Christopher Columbus and did all sorts of asserted burning, pillaging, and sacking of villages across Northern Europe and God knows what else for a thousand years. It's a proud heritage of eating pickled herring. And then, of course, those Norwegians tried to take all the credit for it. Never trust a Norwegian. That's what my uncle always says. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll never forget taking my kids to Disney World, and they wanted to go see the to see so, some, like, breakfast with the princesses or something, and my oldest was horrified that she would have to go to Norway at Epcot to be able to do it, and Uncle Leif would never talk to us again. <laughs> okay, now... I've had my say about Common Core, and it just makes me mad every time I think about it. But we do have to move on because there is other news. And the phone number here, 404-872-0750-1800, WSB-TALK. It is absolutely relevant to the story today, though, that we have a math gap. Despite Common Core, we have a math gap. Now, we have other stuff happening as well out there today that has to be focused on, including the fact that the state continues behind the scenes. We're not getting a lot of coverage of this, you should know. Look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, yeah, that's the way it always goes, doesn't it? I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but we are not getting... There was a report out in December. The Rural Study Commission in the House and the Senate here in Georgia wanting to raise your taxes... They want to raise your taxes to pay for broadband for people who live in rural parts of Georgia. And we haven't gotten a lot of attention since. And then there was a little blurb uh, in uh, the AJC that uh, the president, his big push of late is to do all sorts of new infrastructure spending. And that infrastructure spending, we might be able to provide for rural broadband. But there's legislation making its way through the House and the Senate to raise taxes, and it's not getting a lot of coverage. It is not getting a ton of uh, airtime. It's not getting a ton of media coverage. It's not getting a, a spotlight from, from people in the state legislature who normally would flag these things. And I just wonder, why are people keeping quiet on this, and where are things headed? I really, really vehemently disagree with the idea that Georgia Republicans should be raising taxes on your Netflix and on your Apple Music and on your Spotify and on God knows what else to pay pay for the rural broadband for people who live out in the country. I do not think that is a good idea, particularly when the program would be managed by a technology authority in Georgia that is utterly incompetent. It is a bad use of resources. And what I see locally and what I see nationally is a same frustration for me. Republicans are bad at managing your financial resources. They claim to want smaller government when a Democrat is in charge, but otherwise they are willing to spend just as much as the Democrats. Jamie Dupree flagged a story for me earlier today. The President of the United States estimates that in eight years he will add $7 trillion in deficits. With interest compounded, it'll work out to about $10 trillion. We'll be at $30 trillion. That's... Barack Obama spending. You know, whether you agree with him or not, and I didn't, I vehemently opposed it, Obama could at least hide behind a bad economy and, and Keynesian economics and say, well, we got to spend all this money because the private sector isn't doing it and we got to spur the economy on. We got to do, uh, we got to do demand side spending. Well, the economy is on a roll now that Barack Obama's gone. The economy's glad to be rid of him. The economy's picking up steam, and yet the Republicans are saying, oh, we got to spend just as much as Barack Obama because the economy's good. When do we stop spending as a federal government? When do we stop spending as a state? When do we stop raising people's taxes in cities to offload that money to, to rural areas of the state to give them high-speed internet? You know, there, there, there is, it's not a sin to move. It's very frustrating as a Republican, as a conservative, to see Republicans time and time again, without exception, saying one thing and doing something else and betraying the values they ran on to get elected. Yeah. 
It's 26 after the hour. Uh, we still have some spots left for my interview with Clay Tippins on Tuesday night, a week from tonight at 7 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m., I will interview Clay Tippins, uh, the Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, running for governor in Georgia. Really interested to talk to him about human trafficking. He's the first major gubernatorial candidate this year to bring that up as a as a major issue on his campaign. Uh, if you want to come to the interview, it's a live lounge interview, text WSB to 345-345. There are a few seats left. Um, we are happy to have you come join us for the Clay Tippins interview. Should be a um, should be a good interview. Uh, interesting, intriguing candidate. Uh, we are also that night after Clay Tippins from eight to nine. We are going to do. Well, I am going to do. WSB is going to do an interview with Stacey Abrams who is the Democratic frontrunner for governor. It'll be the same style interview. Um, we are letting her campaign uh, invite some folks in. I will, I think, tomorrow be making it open to everybody else. Um, I just I wanted her campaign to feel comfortable knowing that, that she's coming to a, a conservative audience uh, and make sure that she felt like she had some people in the room who would be there supporting her asking her the same questions I've asked everybody else. Um, we will also, we're working on getting a date for Stacey Evans, uh, the other Democrat running, and I want to ask all of them about uh, the urban-rural divide and attracting Amazon and who they are, their background. Uh, given Tippin's, uh biography, uh, it should be a very, very intriguing conversation with him. Now, in other news out there, oh, yeah, text WSB to 345-345 uh, if you want to come to the Clay Tippins event. In other issues, uh, Richard Burr is the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Jamie Dupree actually flagged this for me earlier today. Richard Burr gave a closing statement in his hearing and he suggests there's a whole lot more going on into the investigation of Russian involvement in our elections than we know, including the fact that companies, not just individuals and campaigns, but companies may have been collaborating with the Russians to undermine our elections. We'll get into that when we come back. It's 39 after the hour, and I'm really tired of this whole wedge nonsense. I, I want sunshine. I, I don't care if it's cold. I don't care if it's hot. I just want to see the sun. I am tired of not being able to see the sun. And this cold, drizzly, damp, gross nonsense, it needs to move on. Okay, now, Richard Burr, he is the senator for North Carolina, chairman of the House and uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. Jamie Dupree sent me his curious audio earlier. We don't have time to play all of it. But some of it, I just want to walk you through this. And, and I was I told Charlie I was going to cut this audio up myself so that I could get it right. And the more I listened to it, the more I thought, you know what, I, I think I'm just going to play it and hit pause on it and, and talk you through some of these things. Um, this is They had an open-door hearing on worldwide threats against the United States. It was the full intelligence community. You had the FBI there, the CIA there, the NSA there, the Director of National Intelligence, um, all of them up there. And I want you to listen to Burr um, talking about uh, the kind of the, the closing of the hearing. Investigation that's going on in Washington. Um, the scope of the special counsel's investigation was clearly stated by the DAG uh, when he hired Bob Mueller. That's the deputy attorney general, DAG. And I think the media has spent some portion of every day trying to portray that that scope of that investigation has changed. The truth is, I don't know. Not sure that anybody uh, in this room knows. But here's what I do know. I know the Senate intel investigation continues. We're hopefully wrapping up some important areas that we have focused on. Now, that right there is important because it everybody's been focused on Devin Nunez in the House. Nobody is focused on the Senate Intelligence Committee, but they've had their own, inve own investigation. And it's clear from remarks that Burr goes on to make 
that the intelligence agencies have been sharing more information with the Senate than the House because they trust the Senate. The vice chairman just alluded to the fact that um, it, it is our hope and our belief that before the primaries begin, we intend to have an overview of uh, our findings that will be public. Before the primaries begin, curious, isn't it? So I suspect that they're looking at Russian interference in the current election, not just in 2016. Otherwise, why would they want to get this information out there before the primaries begin this year? Um, we intend to have an open hearing on election security. Ah, yep, there it and is. It's the committee's intent to make recommendations that will enhance the likelihood that the security of our election process is in place. Which suggests it's not very In addition secure. to that, uh, our review of the ICA, the Intel Community Assessment, which was done in the um, December of 06, uh, 16, um, we have uh, reviewed in great detail. So there was an intelligence assessment completed after the election about Russian involvement. I bet Bob Mueller has a copy of that. Okay, more of Senator Burr from North Carolina. Closing statement at the House, or the Senate, rather, Intelligence Committee. And uh, we hope to report on what we found uh, to support the findings where it's appropriate to be critical uh, if, in fact, we saw areas that uh, we fall, uh, found came up short. We intend to make that um, public. Um, overview to begin with, none of these would be without a declassification process, but we will have a public version that we air as quickly as we can. That's a little bit of throwing shade towards the House Intelligence Committee. And the third piece of review of when we learned of Russians in, Russia's intrusions into our system. Notice he states that as fact, Russia's intrusions into our systems. Not a guess, not speculation. Uh, he's taking it as fact. The Russians did make intrusions into our election processes. That would be the balloting and voter registration list processes. What we did or what we didn't do. And again, with the intent of sharing as much of that with the American public as we can find through open hearings and through an overview. Lastly, we will continue to work towards conclusions related to any cooperation or collusion by any individual, campaign, or company. Notice how he says that. Let's let's walk this back a few seconds. Listen again here. Cooperation or collusion by any individual, campaign, or company. Cooperation or collusion with the Russians is what he's talking about by any individual campaign. Or he lifts up his head and turns his head a little bit and says, or companies. Hmm. Here is the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee telling us that companies, not individuals or campaigns, but companies, American companies, have been implicated by our intelligence community in cooperating or colluding with Russians over the American political system. I wonder what companies he's talking about. I wonder, you know, the left will say, well, obviously Trump organization. What about Fusion GPS? Hmm? What about them? Sounds like we're going to find out a lot of information. Here, here's the key takeaway. There have been investigations ongoing into Russian involvement in our elections. Russian involvement that is ongoing now, not just a past thing in 2016, but ongoing now in the lead up to 2018. And American companies have potentially been helping the Russians. Maybe he's talking about the social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. Something's happening. And the Senate is investigating it. He goes on to talk about the bipartisan cooperation that uh, they they worked really hard on the Senate side to not make this a, an intra-party or inter-party rivalry. Uh, again, throwing shade on the House. And as a result, the intelligence community has been much more forthcoming. 
looks like the Senate is where the action is, not the House, when it comes to seeing what Russia did and did not do. It's Eric Erickson here. It is 55 after the hour. The phone number 404-872-0750. 1-800-WSB-TALK. Have you ever read To Kill a Mockingbird? It is one of my favorite books. Uh, one of my favorite movies as well. Um, it, it, you know, it's one of those things. The, the book, by and large, the book is always better than the movie. There are some exceptions to the rule, but those exceptions tend to prove the rule. The books are better than the movie. Um, The books have more space for depth and breadth and and story, and the movies don't. But uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is one of those where the, the editorial directorial decisions made for the movie just make it such a good standalone movie with or without a book to go with it. And the book is just so good, unless you live in Duluth, Minnesota where students will no longer be required to read To Kill a Mockingbird because it makes them feel uncomfortable and the book uses racial slurs. Y'all, we are a weak people. A weak, weak nation ripe for conquering by the Chinese, the Russians, or someone who doesn't care. I mean, for good Lord, the, 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 the Peter Rabbit controversy over making fun of people with food allergies. Oh, how terrible. How terrible. Hey, in Minnesota, don't send your kid to school in Minnesota. Bunch of liberal quacks. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's 10 after the hour. Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. Um, There is a situation developing. I'm trying to see um, what this is. A situation has developed a Delta Airlines Flight 55 um, that should have... It had gone um, from... It looks like uh, headed from... The Nigerian airport in Logos, Nigeria, um, to Atlanta. Uh, CNN is investigating. Um, there are some reports of a serious incident involving this Airbus A330-200 in Lagos, Nigeria. Pulling up flight tracker, it appears that the flight uh, left Nigeria uh, 15 minutes early, of all things, and has now turned around and gone back to um, the airport in uh, Nigeria. We will keep you posted as CNN um, investigates and develops this. Likewise, uh, there is a United flight, uh, United 1175 from Honolulu to San Francisco. Thankfully, it landed in the last five minutes, um, the covering of the engine on the right side of the plane uh, has fallen off. Uh, Passengers live tweeting the not just collapse of the engine covering, but parts from the engine itself flying off the plane. Um, But it is, has landed safely now in San Francisco. Not the news I was intending to start the show with. We will keep you updated on all of this news throughout the evening here at WSB as this story develops. Um, it appears that the plane, the Delta flight, um, is, as far as we can tell, secured right now. But the story is developing, CNN following in it, uh, and you can stick with us, and I'll keep an eye on it as well so we can see what has happened. Uh, the phone number here, 404-872-0750, wsb talk We've got to get into Blue Apron and box lunches and the federal government, uh, Mick Mulvaney, wants the government to save some money in the food stamp program by sending boxes of food to recipients instead of giving them money on cards to go to the grocery store and buy their own food. I have some strongly held opinions on this, as you might imagine. So, Mick Mulvaney, you've got to give the Trump administration credit. 
they want to improve the program that aids the poor. Um, and one of the things that they are concerned with is cost and nutrition. And the government can buy food wholesale for cheap in ways that you can't by just going to the grocery store. So it got people in government thinking, what if they were to box up food for you that they bought wholesale if you're poor and they can ship you the food like, uh, as Mick Mulvaney said, Blue Apron. Now, I happen to be a Blue Apron customer and it's pretty awesome. Uh, Every week they send me an email and say, here are your meals for the coming week. This past week we had uh, Mexican casserole. Uh, and we had a, a soy glazed chicken. There were beef medallions and pan sauce uh, a week ago. I mean, great stuff. Easy to follow recipes. If you don't really know a lot about cooking, this is actually a, a pretty good way uh, for you to learn how to cook uh, and cook some good stuff. And that's kind of where they are uh, headed is they want to do these sort of box meal things. They would throw in cereals, juices, non-perishable, shelf-stable milk, all these sorts of things. Y'all, I have a feeling Congressman McMulvaney would oppose Budget Director McMulvaney's plan for a number of reasons, one of which is that the government is not very well able to do these sorts of things efficiently. The government of the United States can't get your mail delivered on time in some cases, and yet you think they're going to deliver food to the poor like this? What if there's a government shutdown? Do the people starve to death because they don't get their boxes from the government? This is Soviet-style command and control. And before you roll your eyes and say, oh, no, it's not. If Barack Obama were president of the United States today, you would be saying the same thing if Barack Obama said he's going to box up food and send it to poor people and tell them what they can and cannot have. You were upset with Michelle Obama for making school lunches healthier. And now you want to put the federal government in charge of sending box food to poor people? You know, I can hear some of you saying, well, they shouldn't be on there anyway. They should get off it and go get a job. and They wouldn't have to deal with this. Yeah, maybe in some cases, but not in all cases. In some cases, you yourself have to admit there are people who the government does take care of because they can't take care of themselves. Would you prefer their parents had an abortion? Hmm? There are some people who cannot take care of themselves. The problem we have in this country is that up until the war on poverty by Lyndon Johnson, we had a category of people in this country we called the deserving poor. Even Franklin Roosevelt, in his expansion of the federal welfare state, recognized the deserving poor. There are some people in this country who cannot care for themselves due to mental or physical defect. And we as a society have determined it is a good thing for society to care for these people. Better we care for them than we kill them or have them aborted before they're born, like the Netherlands and Iceland is doing. Well, those people should not be forced to have the federal government send them a box full of food once a month that they may not get if there's a government shutdown with the government saying, we think you're not eating healthy enough, so we're going to put Brussels sprouts in this box, and that's all you're getting. Eat it or starve. You can hear the Soviet commissars right now. Da! Eat it or starve! No! Put the money on a card and let them go buy their own groceries. It's a very American concept, this idea of, of, of choosing your own stuff to eat instead of having the government force feed it to you or send you a cardboard box and say, this is all you're getting, buddy. Starve if you don't like it. That's what a parent does. We as conservatives should be opposed to federal paternalism. Give people the money and teach them the the life skill of going to buy their own groceries. Teach them the life skill of buying healthy food and making healthy choices. Don't send them this box. There is no guarantee the federal government can do this efficiently. In fact, we know that they can't do it efficiently. This is the chief conservative concern of government. Government cannot efficiently do things the private sector can do. Why don't you outsource this program to Blue Apron or HelloFresh or one of their very many competitors out there? Let them do it. They could do it efficiently. And they'd probably have good food and good meals, too. Or don't do it. I applaud this administration for trying to come up with ways to think outside the box in more ways than one here, no pun intended, to try to reform a program that could be reformed, that probably we could have efficiencies. 
but creating a brand new federal program of a government employee boxing up food and sending it to you would just involve more waste, fraud, and abuse. It opens the chain of waste, fraud, and abuse by doing this. We're going to have employees taking a little food off the table. We're going to have companies paying bribes to make sure they get into the program and other companies don't, shutting out their competitors. We're going to have waste and inefficiency. There's no guarantee that people are going to like them. You're going to have to build a whole brand new website so people can log their food allergies and food likes and don't likes and preferences and whatnot. And look at what happened with the Obamacare website. We're never going to be able to get it done. And again, yes, are there people in these programs who shouldn't be there? Absolutely. Let's weed them out. But don't deny that there are some people in these programs who have to be in these programs. Who have to be. Now, uh, real quick, uh, Delta just released a statement uh, to CNN saying uh, Delta Flight 55 from uh, Nigeria to Atlanta landed safely at the airport in Lagos after an issue with one of its engines on an A330-200. Customers evacuated by slides. Uh, five customers reporting non-critical injuries. Situation okay. Good to hear. Prayer for those involved. And man, I don't like Airbus planes. I just don't. I wish Delta would just stick with Boeing, but that's a side preference. Neither here nor there. A buddy of mine sent me a great email uh, earlier today. Let me just read. It's just just two quotes in, uh, next to each other. Here's the first quote. Anyone in any walk of life who is content with mediocrity is untrue to himself and to American tradition. That's George S. Patton uh, writing in War As I Knew It in 1947. Anyone in any walk of life who is content with mediocrity is untrue to himself and to American tradition. And then there's American Olympian Chloe Kim. She was assured of the gold medal. And yet she went back, already knowing she was going to get the gold, and got a 98.5 performance on the snowboard half pipe when asked why she would go back and do it all over again, knowing she was already assured of gold. She said, I knew I wasn't going to be completely satisfied taking home the gold, knowing that I could have done better. Chloe Kim, her dad, by the way, there at the performance, pointing at himself as the cameras turned to him and just saying American dream. American dream. You know, I just, I love the Olympics. Uh, now, you know, I, I'm with several friends of mine who think that, that some of these, including the, the, the half pipe here where you've got judges assigning scores based on what the judges think. I don't know that they I would consider them sports in the usual sense, but some of them, I mean, the luge, the skeleton, the cross country skiing, the biathlon, I just it, it's it's amazing, and, and these folks they're not accepting money. They got to work for sponsorships. Some of them have trouble bringing family over, and just the stories are amazing. And here's this young lady, an immigrant no less, wanting to do better and better. It's 40 after the hour. My buddy Fred and I were just trading messages on Twitter about curling. I love to watch curling. You know, the Olympic sport where they hurl the weight down the, the slab of ice and people are sweeping in front of it. I, I just think it is fantastic. Not a bit ironic uh, that women's curling is going to start on Valentine's night. Uh, watching women walk down the floor, sweeping brooms, uh, sweeping the floor as people throw their weight around. I, I just think it is fantastic. I, I love to watch Women sweeping the floor as I throw my weight around. <laughs> I seriously though, I, I like I, I just I'm fascinated by curling. Absolutely fascinated by curling. Um as, as they, they push the way the, the men start tonight at seven oh five and the women start tomorrow night at seven oh five. Uh, they've had the the mix the Canadians a eh? they they won the they have couples curling now where the man shoves the weight down and the woman sweeps is very very sexist. <laughs> oh, perhaps we should move on before I get myself in real trouble. Immigration, they have opened up the process on the floor, except they haven't really opened the process. 
Uh, the Republicans are still controlling the process to make sure a Republican bill takes shape. Democrats right now are playing nice by and large. Uh, Dick Durbin of Illinois saying that he appreciates the process that's going on right now. Uh, but what's happening is very interesting. Um, Tom Cotton came out this morning and made public what he told me two weeks ago, that the 1.8 million um, DACA recipients eligible for citizenship, that is the the number. The president is refusing to go higher than that. In fact, this morning, Tom Cotton started out the debate essentially saying, take it or leave it. You can have 1.8 million uh, DACA recipients or DACA eligible people on a pathway to citizenship, or you can um, you can have nothing. So we'll see where this goes. I don't believe anything they come up with in the Senate can pass the House. The House is very divided, and what reporters are missing is that the Democrats in the House are as divided as the Republicans. There are Republicans who want a path to citizenship for DACA residents, but there are Republicans who want everybody rounded up and deported. That's a striking divide, but on the Democratic side, there are those who want DACA recipients to have citizenship and no one else, and there are those who want DACA recipients to have citizenship and give their parents and everyone else citizenship as well. I, 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 the media is going to focus on the Republican divide. They would whether Republicans were in charge or not. Um, but I just don't see that this legislation that's con- being conjured up in the Senate is going to be able to make it through the House of Representatives, given the deep divides on both sides. And Democrats benefit right now by Republicans being in charge, so they can vote united for or against a plan, really, and let the Republicans fight amongst themselves. We'll see whether they do or not. Now, here's another one. Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee. I'm I'm just going to tell you guys something. Time and time again, we have seen, and it is a white male Republican establishment, do everything possible to shut out female and minority conservatives. We saw it with Karen Handel in Georgia. You know, if Karen Handel were were governor of Georgia right now, we'd probably have a Religious Freedom Restoration Act on the book. She would have signed it. Yep, she would have. But yet there were some some good Christian folks who just couldn't couldn't get over the fact that that she she had a record they couldn't trust on abortion, even though she fought Planned Parenthood. We've seen the Republican establishment rally to Charlie Crist against Marco Rubio. We saw the Republican establishment rally against Nikki Haley, choosing anybody but Nikki in South Carolina. We saw him do it with Bobby Jindal when he ran for governor in Louisiana the first time. Not the second time they rallied to him the second time, but the first time they wanted anybody but. Saw him do it with Ted Cruz. Time and time again, it is the conservatives, it is the Tea Partiers, it is the the upstarts who find women and minority conservatives and run them for office. And it is the white male Republican establishment that opposes them. And we're seeing this happen now in Tennessee. Bob Corker decided he couldn't get reelected in Tennessee, and so he decided to step down and go away and retire as he should. Marsha Blackburn stood up. But Blackburn, (gasps) she got the Club for Growth support. She got the Senate conservatives fun support. She got my support. She got a bunch of conservative support. And so now Bob Corker, he's pushing a story that, oh, Marsha can't win. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha can't win. Everybody in Tennessee loves Marsha Blackburn. To the extent reporters are pushing the story that Marsha Blackburn is in trouble and can't win in Tennessee, it is the extent that they are embracing Bob Corker's self-serving lying talking points that he needs to stay in the Senate because only Bob Corker can win. Bob Corker needs to go back under his bridge in Knoxville. Bob Corker needs to leave the Senate. And it is the height of arrogance for Bob Corker to think that only he can win in Tennessee, that Marsha Blackburn can't. It is the height of arrogance for Bob Corker to be sabotaging Marsha Blackburn's campaign for the Senate because, God help us, she might actually be a conservator from Tennessee in the Senate. He can't have that now, can he? She might actually vote for Republican policies, unlike Bob. It is just offensive, ridiculous. 
that the media would buy this story about Bob Corker. Bob Corker cannot win the primary. If Bob Corker decides to try to stay, I will go up to Tennessee and do door knocking for Marsha Blackburn. She is an improvement to Bob Corker. And it is really pathetic that a bunch of old white guys in the Senate who see their power slipping away after generations to young female and minority conservatives think, oh God, we, we got to keep the white guys in here because we can't have these people who are minority and female and are actually more conservative than us. That'll explode us for the fraud charlatans and hucksters we've always been. Can't have that now, can we? It's 55 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. Uh, No reason to give you people the phone number now because the show is almost over. Guy Benson from Town Hall. He's headed to Brown University to talk to the Brown Republicans in the Watson, Watson Institute for International Public Affairs. Guy Benson, if you don't know, at Town Hall, he is a... Young, white, male, gay, Republican. And a group of students, the collective of students, they call themselves at Brown, have decided that Guy Benson, showing up on campus, who is gay, that his mere presence would advance white supremacy and oppress the LGBTQIABCDEFG community. That's right. That's right. Um, It would be dangerous to the well-being of marginalized groups and enabling of white supremacy. I mean, you know, even Jonathan Chait, who is a a liberal's liberal, a a super progressive at um, New Yorker magazine, even he's out blasting this group, pointing out that the the students, um, they're not even they're not even obfuscating here. They they believe that Guy Benson showing up. Um, has he has no right to free speech on a college campus. This is really, really, really dumb. But it's only going to get worse. Um, these college students feel emboldened and empowered to do this by university administrations. You know, the University of Chicago president um, sent out a, a statement to his students saying, nope, if you don't like it, you don't have to show up, but you're not going to uh, denounce or harass speakers on this college campus. All views are welcome. More like that, please. Please. 